Good evening. Welcome to the West Covina City Council Chambers for the June 12th meeting of the West Covina Planning Commission. Pledge of Allegiance tonight will be led by Commissioner Valles. We ask you to remain standing for a few moments of silent prayer. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Hey, roll call, please. Commissioner Valles? Here. Commissioner Holtz? Commissioner Woods? Here. Commissioner Minifee? Here. Chairman Stewart? Here. Any changes to, to the minutes of uh, May 22nd meeting? If not, they're approved as read. We are going to be have a uh, staff tonight is going to be fine tuning our uh, uh, meeting for a future broadcast, live broadcast. So we're going to go through the meeting just like it would be a normal broadcast. Even though I don't have any oral communications card, I'm going to read everything. And they're going to go ahead and uh, uh, get it so that we have it done pat when it happens. So first of all, we'll go to communication, oral communications. This is a time when any member of the public may speak to the commission on any matter within the scope of duties assigned to the commission. Other matters included on this agenda may be addressed when that item is under consideration. For all oral communications, the chairperson may impose reasonable limitation on public comments to assure an orally and timely meeting. The Ralph M. Brown Act limits the planning commission and staff's ability to respond to public comments at this meeting. Thus, your comments may be agendized for a future meeting or referred to staff. The commission may also ask questions for clarifications if desired at this time. By policy of the commission, oral communications at this time on the agenda is limited to a total of 15 minutes. Persons who are not afforded the opportunity to speak at this time may do so under item E later on the agenda. As I said, I have no uh, cards for oral communications. Does anybody wish to speak at this time? All right, seeing none, we'll go ahead and uh, go to the uh, consent calendar. This is a time for the public to comment on any item on the consent calendar. As consent calendar items are considered routine in nature, they are normally enacted in one motion. The chairperson may remove a questioned consent calendar item for sep separate action. Forthcoming planning commission meetings and public hearing schedules. May I have staff report, please? Yes. yes, the only item on the forthcoming is the, um, actually on the consent calendar is the forthcoming. We will not have a meeting on June 26th, so we don't have any items. Uh, we, are, we do anticipate items on the July 10th meeting, so we plan on having a meeting uh, at that time. So in about a month, we'll have another meeting. That's all that's on the consent calendar. All right, do I have a motion to approve that, please? That, you make a motion, you'll make a motion. Uh, motion to approve by Commissioner Valles. Second by who? Second. Second by Mr. Uh, Commissioner Menifee. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Four zero, in favor? <coughs> All right, we'll go ahead and go to public hearings. The first one is a conditional use permit number 12-03, variance number 1203, Categorically exempt, the applicant is Veronica Espinoza for friendly CPR and first aid training. Location is 2640 East Garvey Avenue, number 105. Requesting an, the applicant is requesting a conditional use permit to allow the operation of a 500 square foot CPR and first aid training school within an existing two-story office building. The project also consists of a request to vary from standards for parking requirements. The project is located in the office professional OP zone. Here we have the staff report, please. Associate Planner Ron Garcia will be presenting that report. Good evening, uh, Chairman, members of the Commission. Um, Jeff is um, currently handing out a letter of support that was provided uh, later this, uh, earlier this evening um, by the property owner of the said case. Uh, the, application is re the applicant is requesting the approval of a conditional use permit to allow uh, the operation of a CPR and first aid training 
uh, within an existing 500 square foot two-story office building. Uh, the project also consists of a request to vary from uh, parking standard requirements. Uh, the site. <coughs> Sites located on the uh, east side of Citrus, uh, North Citrus Street. You have the Scarvey Avenue, McIntyre Square is right uh, south of there. Uh, the storage facility and Eastern Mall to the north. Uh, the proposed school provides uh, various uh, beginner and advanced uh, instruction in CPR and first aid. Uh, upon completion of a five-hour five program and provided with uh, uh, students are provided with the completion card the end of the training uh, that is valid for two years. The instructional hours proposed are from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. and 6.15 p.m. to 9 p.m. during the week and 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. during the weekend. Uh, the applicant anticipates one instructor and one student per session during the day and one instructor and, one, and 15 students uh, during the evening hours and weekend. Uh, again, as stated, the applicant is requesting a parking variance to deviate from the uh, code requirements. Uh, the existing tenants within the office building include uh, a dental office and professional offices. Uh, the office building includes 7,950 square feet of office floor area, uh, 14 open parking spaces, and 16 parking spaces within the subterranean uh, parking garage for a total of 30 spaces on site. Uh, there are seven tenant spaces within the building that are currently vacant. Uh, the code requires one space per two employees and one space per two students for college, business, and trade schools. Uh, the school will require nine parking spaces, and the remainder of the office building uh, would therefore require 28 spaces based on the code. Uh, due to the proposed school and existing dental office within the building, uh, the site would therefore have a deficit of seven parking spaces. Uh, due to the parking requirements, the applicant, therefore, is requesting uh, that variance. Uh, staff conducted an observational parking survey uh, to determine the current parking demand of the site between May 23rd and June 1st. Uh, that has been included in your staff report. Uh, the parking survey provides information on how many vehicles were parked of the 14 open parking spaces outside of the parking garage. Uh, 16 parking spaces within the parking garage are not available to clients or patrons of the proposed business. Uh, the results uh, of the survey indicate that the current peak parking demand is generally in the early afternoon begin beginning at 1.30. Uh, the survey indicates that at 1.30 p.m. in the afternoon, three to seven parking spaces uh, were occupied. Um, at 4.30 in the afternoon, three to five parking spaces were occupied. Uh, and lastly, between the hours of 6.30 and 7, one to three parking spaces were occupied. Uh, therefore, during the two-week survey, staff uh, did not encounter full occupancy of the 14 parking spaces uh, within that area surveyed. Uh, after 6 p.m., there were between 11 and 13 parking spaces available. Uh, Off-street parking is available. Uh, if over, overflow occurs, uh, staff estimates uh, that as many as 12 vehicles could park on Garvey Avenue in front of the site, which is in this area. along this area. Uh, we dimension them uh, as required by the code, so the site at the front uh, here would, uh, would allow for at least 12 parking spaces. Um, in order to address the potential parking problems, uh, staff has included a number of conditions in the resolution, uh, and those include limiting the, the square footage, uh, limiting the number of students uh, during the day and in the evening while businesses are open, uh, as well as restrict the maximum of students during the evening and weekends uh, while businesses are not open. Uh, in the event that a parking problem does develop, uh, staff has included conditions to allow the commission to review the, the issue. Uh, given the parking deficit generated with the proposed use, 
Uh, the applicant has agreed to limit the number of instructors and students during normal business hours. Uh, the applicant will schedule larger classes um, after normal business hours when there are a few other tenants uh, or patrons in the building. Uh, this arrangement should reduce the probability of a parking problem uh, at the office building. Um, staff therefore recommends that the Planning Commission uh, re adopt resolutions for the conditional use permit and variance. Uh, that concludes staff's uh, presentation. The applicant is present uh, if the Commission has any questions. Thank you, Ron. Any commission question at this time for the staff? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Commissioner. I noticed also that you have a condition which says basically if this doesn't work, it creates a parking problem that the planning director or his designee can bring us back to the planning commission for further study. That is correct. Yes. That's very helpful. I appreciate that. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, does the applicant wish to speak? Well, we do have one question for you. Come on forward. <laughs> yes, then state your name, please. My name is All right, Barnica. Um, I do have one question. The underground parking, what is the story there? Is that just for the tenants only? It is parking. And what do you, how, how do you get in there? Do you have a? I have a remote control. Remote control, and how many spots do you have there? Well, I'm not total. What, what, how many are you allowed? Oh, inside, I'm allowed. You're allowed one? Yes. Okay, that's fine. That's what I wanted to know. Any other questions? The applicant? All right, thank you, Veronica. Any other um, comments in uh, favor of this uh, proposal? Are there anything, anybody opposed to it? All right, seeing none, we'll go ahead and close the public uh, testimony and go to uh, commission discussion. I'll go ahead and uh, lead us off here in uh, our parking situation there. I, I've been by there three different uh, times. I don't think the same days as some of the other ones were, but I was there at 6 at night and 11 in the morning and 1.30 in the afternoon. I never saw more than four cars in that uh, you know, public parking lot, so I don't, I, I don't see any problem there. I realize there's empties there, uh, empty uh, places, however. If something comes up in the future where they have as many people coming as you do, we could, uh, you know, at that time we could make a consideration. So, uh, therefore, I'm in, I'm in favor of this, and uh, I see no problem at the, at the immediate time. Any other questions, answers for the commission here? I have Commissioner Reyes, go ahead. Well, I got your Wrong. students. Come on forward. They're coming from where? Um, just anybody who's in need of um, CPR services. Okay. Any else? Uh, so it's professionals, students. Um, anybody who's medical, anybody, uh, teachers, I do uh, daycare workers, I do teens that need um, CPR, some certification, some non, um, babysitting safeties. Anybody's welcome for CPR. And the ones that need certification um, do get the certification that they need for their uh, employment. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Or just as a comment, Mr. Chairman, I've watched this property since it was built about, I don't know, 10 or so years ago and wondered what kind of people would be there. It's, it's wonderful access from the freeway but it's very small and restrictive, and that's what we're running into, of course, in this conditional use permit today. Uh, there is, I believe, though, parking across the street in the, what probably is McIntyre property uh, to take care of some short-term needs that, that might be uh, part of it. Anyway, I think it's, it's wonderful. I think it's good to use property like that that was set fallow for, since the freeway was built. And uh, I, I certainly support this project. All right, thank you. Any other questions, answers? Okay. All right, with that, we'll go ahead and uh, close the commission discussion and ask the staff for the resolution numbers. The resolution, there are two resolutions here. Actually, there's a conditional use permit for the operation of the business and a, and a variance for the uh, parking. 
Uh, so the resolution numbers would be 12-5469 and 12-5470. Okay, thank you. We need a motion to approve these. So moved. Commissioner Minifee. And uh, Commissioner Woods, Woods is second. Okay. Do okay. you want to do each one of them separate? Uh, roll call? I think we can do them together. Okay. Just roll do call, a roll please. call vote for both uh, the mm -hmm. CEP and the variance. Commissioner Valles? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Woods, Aye. Commissioner Minifee, Aye. Chairman Stewart. Aye. If we don't have it on here, do we have to? Uh, Probably a good idea to say it, yeah. Yeah, okay. I'll, 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 Go I'll, ahead. The, yeah. This uh, item has been approved and you can, uh, th there's an appeal period of 10 days if there was some issue with the, um, either with somebody who didn't like the approval or if you didn't like one of the conditions, you have the ability to appeal within 10 days to the city council. Otherwise, the approval would stand. Correct. Thank you and good luck. All right, we'll move on to item four, which is a variance number 12-06, category exemption. The applicant is uh, Bickle Underwood for McDonald's. The location is 2623 East Valley Boulevard, and the request is requesting a variance for a reduced width landscape buffet, buffer along the western perimeter of the site that is adjacent to residential development. The subject site is located in the service commercial SC zone. So may I have a staff report, please? Amy Davis, our assistant planner, will be presenting that report. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman Stewart. Good evening, Commissioners. Just to quickly provide some history on the site, the existing McDonald's building was constructed in 1970. Last July, the Planning Commission approved a precise plan to reconstruct the existing building, as well as a conditional use permit for a new dual lane drive through In April, the Planning Director approved a Planning Director's modification for building and site modifications. McDonald's has determined that they would prefer to have additional on-site parking, primarily to serve employees so that they do not park in the spaces located on the east side of the site, which are adjacent to the main entrance of the restaurant and other businesses located within the shopping center. Therefore, the applicant is requesting a variance for a reduced width landscape buffer to allow for an increase in the number of on-site parking spaces the municipal code requires a minimum of six feet of landscaping when either the rear or side yard of a commercial site is adjacent to residential zoning. The western perimeter of the site is adjacent to two carports and open parking spaces that serve the neighboring apartment complex. And the northern perimeter of the site is adjacent to the complex's tennis courts. Originally, 33 spaces were proposed, including one parallel space along the western perimeter. 37 spaces were proposed with the approved modifications, including six parallel spaces along the western perimeter. The applicant is currently proposing 45 spaces, including 10 45 degree angle and four 90 degree angle spaces along the western perimeter. In order to accommodate the 10 45 degree angle spaces, the adjacent landscape buffer is proposed in a sawtooth pattern with dimensions that range from seven feet three inches at its widest point to one foot eight inches at its narrowest point. A minimum six foot landscape buffer would have provided just a little over 1,200 square feet of landscaping, 1,202 to be exact. Uh, the proposed sawtooth landscape buffer will provide 1,000 231 square feet of landscaping. A condition of approval has been included requiring the applicant to provide a minimum of five trees within the sawtooth buffer as well as shrubs and ground cover. Notices of public hearing were mailed to 111 owners and occupants of properties within 300 feet of the subject site. No phone calls or letters of concern were received. The granting of this variance will not negatively impact residents of the neighboring apartment complex because the 10 45 degree angle spaces will be adjacent to the complex's carports, 
and open parking spaces. Additionally, a block wall ranging in height from six feet to 10 feet separates McDonald's site from the apartment site, and the closest residential units are approximately 44 feet from the property line. In closing, staff recommends that the Planning Commission adopt a resolution approving variance number 1206. This concludes the staff report. I would be happy to answer any questions you have. The applicant is here this evening as well. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Amy. Any questions for staff at this time? Uh, yes, I have okay, one question. Uh, handicapped parking, now they're increasing the number of parking spaces here, I think. Does that mean they need to add handicapped parking spaces also? That, that usually comes to us from the building division, so I don't know the answer to that. Did, did, there's no condition on that. Uh, w the building division uh, w would have a, an answer for that, but unfortunately we don't have any representative from them. The applicant might have, might have some knowledge of that. <coughs> any other questions this time? All right, seeing none, would the applicant like to speak, please? Thank you, Chair, Thank Commissioners. You. I'm Ron Underwood, representing McDonald's, Long Beach, California, their um, home base in this region. Um, with regards to your question, Mr. Menifee, about the parking, the, uh, for, for this type of, of facility, if you have 50 parking stalls or more, you will need three handicapped spaces, even with the additional parking that we're going to get, um, assuming we get approved tonight, we will be at 45 overall stalls, so we'll, we will be at, under that threshold. Um, I've got the owner of the restaurant here as well to answer your questions. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Commissioner Reyes. Where would you locate the uh, handicap? By the entrance? The, the code is very, very strict. It requires that all handicap stalls must be as the closest parking stalls that are on the property must be the ones that are allocated to handicap. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, sir. Any other questions at all? Okay, thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Good evening, Chairman and Council. Uh, Brian Carmack. I'm the right. owner and the operator of the restaurant, and I just thought I'd make myself available for uh, any questions, and then I had a couple of comments that I uh, wanted to say. So I'll start with my comments unless you... Go right ahead. I just wanted to thank the uh, Planning Commission for, uh, for looking at this and the Planning Department because I know they've, they've had to revisit this a few times, and I appreciate their, their uh, patience. Um, one of the things that, you know, long term that, you know, we obviously have hope for the site because we're making, you know, a considerable investment here. This is, you know, complete rebuild is that additionally, you know, there's a, there's a sign that's been approved for the, uh, the Nogala side of the, the, this property in total. And, uh, you know, I definitely have my fingers crossed that at some point the other properties on this site will develop in, in something that's attractive and, and brings traffic off of Nogales once the signage hopefully improves the site to the point where, you know, maybe we can get some, you know, some B or A level development. You know, it, it, with that in consideration looking forward, I think, you know, parking is always going to be critical. And I just thought it was just a wiser use of the space to have the additional 13 or 14 spaces on that side of the building given that the uh, proximity to the neighbor next door and the tenant and the visibility from the street, uh, you know, I think we could accomplish everything required with the landscaping that we've proposed here. Um, and additionally, too, is, you know, that, that my employees, they love to park on the drive through side of the building because they all work in there and they can watch their cars. <laughs> so they would park there anyways. And, uh, and, and that does the customers a favor because there's nothing, as a business person, I hate more is when the employees take up the best spaces. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're making it easy for them to do the right thing if this is approved. And I think that's just long term, that's just going to be to the whole, the whole site's advantage. And I, I just wanted to, to make that comment. I, I think that kind of reflects the comments that the Amy and the staff observed for as well. But I, I wanted to thank them for their, their time with this. And, and certainly any questions, I'd be happy to answer. See you then. We're set. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Anybody else in favor like to speak? Seeing none, anyone opposed? All right, we'll go ahead and uh, close the public portion and open for a commission discussion. I'll go ahead and start it again, seeing that I was here in the commission when uh, 
we first voted the project. I know it's under construction right now. And I see no problem with what we've got here today before us because one thing on the west side there is not only a block wall all the way down, but it's only on the other side is only carports from the apartment house back there. And secondly, it's, I think it's, I believe it's 44 feet from the uh, nearest apartment. And also, uh, on the good side, they're getting 45 stalls as opposed to the required 35, and uh, their landscaping uh, is required at uh, 3,500 square feet, and they're still at 6,200 square feet, even with this project on here. I like the idea of the uh, west side parking for the employees, just like the gentleman said, to keep them separated from the uh, everyday traffic. So I'm definitely in favor of uh, passing this tonight, and I look forward to the discussion from the rest of the commission. Questions ready? No. Okay. Questions? No. Uh, Commissioner Woods. Today I spent some time and walked throughout the whole area of the world. And I think it's a very, very, I couldn't find any problems with it at all. So I would uh, accept it as it is. All right. Anyone else? Okay, seeing that, I'll close the commission discussion and uh, ask the staff to read the resolution numbers. Resolution number for this variance is 12 5471. 5471. Do we have a motion? Make a motion. Make, yeah. Commissioner Vias made a motion to approve. To approve. Okay. I'll second by Commissioner Woods. Roll call, please. Commissioner Vias. Yes. Commissioner Woods. Here. Yes. Commissioner Menifee. Yes. Chairman Stewart. Aye. Passes 4-0. The decision here is final yeah. unless appeal within 10 days. The State so Council. Have right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Good luck. Okay. We'll move on to non-hearing items. Uh, study session for subcommittee for design review, history, authority, and guidelines. Turn it over to staff, please. We've got a little dog and pony show we're trying to put together. Um, this study session is regarding the history and the authority of the subcommittee for design. Subcommittee for design is a subcommittee of the Planning Commission, consists of, of two members. I'm going to kind of cover a, a little bit uh, the, the staff report that's item number five, and then we're going to have a, uh, have a PowerPoint on, on, on some information to help out too. Since there are three new Planning Commissioners, we thought it was appropriate time to provide information to the Planning Commission on the background, how we got to where we're at with the subcommittee. <clears throat> Just for your knowledge, you may remember from the last meeting, the subcommittee members currently are Dave Stewart and Don Holtz, and uh, Rudy Vias is the alter alternate, and Rudy was able to uh, take part this evening because of Don's absence. The Planning Commission established the Design Review Subcommittee in late 2003, and the, the idea there was to review architectural changes to single-family houses. They did that under the authority of the Planning Commission to set up subcommittees to, to to perform certain functions that were part of the function of the Planning Commission. Um, and the purpose was to ensure that changes to individual houses are compatible with the structures on the property and with the neighborhood, primarily with the, with the neighborhood. That was the, the original uh, con uh, concern. In 2008, the Planning Commission and City Council approved a code amendment that codified and granted authority to the Planning Commission subcommittee for a design to review single-family construction. So while it started in 2003 as a, an idea of, of the Planning Commission, uh, since 2008, it is now a code uh, adopted or required uh, uh, subcommittee of the Planning Commission. So it's in the code just like the Planning Commission, just like the Human Resources Commission, just like the Community Services Commission. And, <laughs> In the code, it, it gives us several, um, the, it tells what types of construction we're, that, that the subcommittee is, has the authority to review. So it's a, it's a narrow window of, of things that, that are reviewed. And I have attached the code as um, attachment three. It's a fairly short section of the code, and it's not as cumbersome as other sections of the code that we, we may go over at some time in the future. Um, the types of construction that are reviewed are new construction of single-family residences, so a new house on a vacant lot, 
Uh, structural additions or modifications on the front, front elevation of a residence. New second story additions to one story residences. New second story additions to two story residences. New balconies and other modifications that are re readily visible from the public right of way. So basically in a single family setting, anything you can see that's it's changed from, the, from view from the public, that falls under the, the authority of the, the subcommittee. The stated purpose of the subcommittee is to ensure quality development, promote orderly development of the city, conserve property values, preserve the architectural character of an area, and to promote harmonious design that is complementary to adjacent properties. And that's quoted from the code. That's what the code says that the, the responsibility of the subcommittee is. Over the years, the subcommittee has formulated certain guidelines, which we, we, we kind of refer to as rules of thumb. They're not codes, they're not strict and hard and fast, they're guidelines that the, the subcommittee generally um, will agree with, but sometimes they have the ability to, to decide, well, there's an exception to this guideline for this, this, or this reason. Um, as a result of the issues that surrounded two-story additions, the subcommittee first developed uh, the guidelines for two-story. And the, the, the whole point of the guidelines was to as, assist homeowners, architects, and contractors in preparing plans that could be readily approved by the subcommittee. So ideally, what happens is we, they come to staff at the counter and they say, we want to do this, what do we need to do to get approval? We say, well, follow these guidelines. If, they, if you meet these guidelines, the subcommittee is going to approve you. And it pretty much works that way. The subcommittee is, is pretty, pretty clear on what, what, their, um, what their goals are and try to stick to, to the, the purpose of what the goals are for. After we developed this, the second story uh, guidelines, we determined that it was important also to have first story guidelines. So we also developed those. So we have those, and those are uh, in front of you as attachment one and two. <clears throat> and again, they're, they're meant to convey to applicants the subcommittee rules of thumb in a manner to allow consideration prior to the preparation of plans for review. So it assists us to be able to tell us the people at the counter what to expect from the subcommittee. Therefore, they're not surprised when something happens. Um, to exemplify some of the, w the guidelines, I'm going to have the PowerPoint presentation first on one story and then on two story houses. If you could get the lights for us. Some of these are text and others are, uh, are, are photographs of houses. So, and this isn't necessarily in the order that the, the uh, guidelines are in the, in, the, um, in the attachments that are in front of you. But So design the house so that all setbacks have been met and design the front and any visible elevations with a variety of materials, um, providing alternative materials such as stone, wood, brick, wood siding, wrapping around 20 to 24 inches on the sides. So that, those are the first two guidelines. Oops. Oh, let me, I can move it. <laughs> okay, so this is a house um, that has alternative materials. It's, it's an older house. It hasn't been updated. It's pr probably what it was built with, the original design. And, and as I, you know, I wouldn't, in 2003 when we started this process, I was, I was surprised when I went out because we had this alternative material idea. I was surprised when I went out to see that almost every single subdivision in West Covina was developed with an alternative material. It's not a new idea. It's been around probably since the creation of subdivisions that you provide some kind of what, what I call is like the, the chocolate chip and the cookie. You want to have some, something different. You don't just want to have the cookie. You want to have chocolate chips in it too to provide the accent and a little bit of interest in an elevation. So this is a good example of something that was probably built in the 50s, but it clearly had an alternative material, in this case wood siding. Um, Here's another house that might have been updated, but I'm not sure this also is an older looking house. It was probably built in the 50s. And uh, you may be able to see it, maybe a little hard to see, but the base here is, is brick. It's red brick. And it's probably, again, it was probably constructed that way. Um, so that one has a brick base. This house also has a brick base. And it has a little bit, it's got a little bit of mixture. It's also got some wood, wood siding. What we call, this is a Dutch gable. So there's a little bit of gable showing there, and it has some wood siding there. So two types of alternative materials in, in that house. And these are good slides, because I really I like to emphasize that to people, that we're not trying to create something that has, wasn't already there. This is a design concept that people in the 50s understood and knew about. And, and today, we, we sometimes uh, have people that just want to take off all, the, all the, uh, the accents and just put a stucco facade. And it doesn't usually work out that well um, when they do that. 
So this is an example of an older house that is developed just with stucco materials. And it's a smaller house and obviously in need of a lot of repair, um, but, but it is an example of what, what you get when you just have a stucco facade. No, no window treatment, mini, minimal um, porch treatment. It's a pretty, pretty uh, bland house. Um, and this is a photo sim of what could be done with that house. Uh, and it's a little bit dark, but yeah, it's got wood siding on it. They, they put wood porch um, supports on it, and you've got some window treatment that wasn't there before, and landscaping. That's the same house with, that's been fixed up. Um, so that, that gives you some idea of, of what, what can be done to a house and how it changes the look of a house, just by simple things. This is another house that was perhaps developed with no alternative materials, or the other possibilities that had alternative materials, and somebody took them off because they didn't want to deal with them anymore. Um, and this is a photo simulation of the same house with wood siding, again with a porch support and some uh, nicer windows, the design that's put on there, and clearly some landscape upgrades. Photo simulation. Photo simulation. So yeah, that's just, we, somebody took it and painted it on the, on the picture. Yeah, well, there you go, wishful thinking. All right, so this next house, we, when we say alternative materials, we are generally looking for uh, uh, an accent, a difference, something that's alternative to the main. Now this is an example of a house that decided just to put it instead of, what they did was they took alternative <laughs> materials and put them on steroids. So the whole house is alternative materials. Well, too much of a good thing can be too much of a good thing. So th this is probably not what we would suggest when we're suggesting alternative materials. You want the touches of it, an accent, not the whole thing. Um, All right, other, other standards or uh, guidelines we have. Front porch roof lines should be lower in height than the main portion of the roof. There's some kind of design philosophy out there in, in the public sometimes that they want their porch to be the tallest part of the house. And you don't see that in older houses, uh, and I'm not sure where that thought comes from. It may be a grand mansion feel, but if you put a great big porch on the front of a small house, it's still a small house. You didn't change anything, and it makes it look out of scale. So that's one thing that we, we always suggest. And then water heater enclosures should be constructed to match the colors and materials of the house. And those are for water heaters that are visible on a side, on a corner lot, or that are visible somehow because they're up to the front on the side elevation. Clearly, we, we try to keep water heaters off the front elevation. So here's some examples. This is a, this is a well-designed porch. It's a pretty tall porch. There's nothing wrong with a taller porch. But as you can see, the porch height is shorter than the main height of the building. And if you made that four or five feet taller, you would end up with kind of an awkward looking structure. So we, we, uh, we recommend that. This is an example. It's a little hard to see because it's painted the same color, but it's kind of dented up. It's a metal enclosure. Um, we would generally suggest if you're going to do, if you're going to end up with a enclosure on, the, on a side yard, you should probably develop it in the same material as the house so it looks like part of the house, not some kind of just tacked on there. Um, so that, that's, a, that's, a, that's the water heater. And then there's another water heater here that's kind of built in a little closet. It's a metal. Again, ideally you would try to screen that with something that, um, that matches the, the house exterior material. <clears throat> Close attention should be paid to corner houses. That's the wrap around. And the first one we talked about, you should wrap it around 20 or 24 inches. Um, this is a corner house. The next slide, I think, shows a little better. You can see that, you know, that in one sense, this is a side elevation. But in another sense, it's just as much an elevation as this one because they're both very visible from the street. So if, if this house did have, uh, it may have some alternative materials over here that you can't see. But if it, let's say it had a brick base here, you would want it to wrap around and maybe even go back as far as, as the, the, the wall to provide that nice, uh, a better look. If the roof pitch is being raised, consider designing the new pitch to allow attic space to accommodate a central air conditioning heating system. And this is one of those things that's very difficult because we do have some, we do have some uh, subdivisions in the city of West Covina that they were built without attics. They have a very low roof pitch. They don't have anywhere to run um, the ducting for central air or heating. So it becomes a real difficulty. We have, and you end up with something that looks like that. And it's not easy to, to fix that. You can't fix that, you know, 
Uh, but if the in, 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 well, only thing this is suggesting is if they change the roof pitch, they should think about making it tall enough. Don't just change it a little bit. Make it enough so that you got room for ducting. Here's another example. Oh, I just get one example there. That that one doesn't come up all that much it, to subcommittee. <clears throat> Okay, so now we're nearing the end. These are, we don't have any photos of these last things, but these are the other um, guidelines that we have. Design the house to be architecturally compatible with, na with the neighborhood. So there are some neighborhoods where you have very consistent frontages. And let's say, just for sake of discussion, that you have a whole neighborhood of, of wood-sided wood ranch houses that are one story. And now somebody comes in right in the middle of the, the block, and they want to put in a two-story straight up and down Mediterranean. No wood siding and it's just all stucco or adobe or something like that. The question then is, is that really architecturally compatible with the neighborhood? There, there is some responsibility on the, that, that homeowner to, to, to be consistent. And that's, that's, a, that's a source of discussion for the subcommittee and sometimes for the planning commission as well to, to determine if, if it's appropriate. Provide window treatments such as pop-outs, wood trim, pot shelves, shutters, recessed windows, et cetera. Especially on a front elevation, you want to have some window treatment. You don't just have a flush window that's got, you know, just flush with the, the facade. Uh, and it, again, if you look at older houses, you'll see that. You'll see wood trim around uh, most windows. In an area that is predominantly rear entry garages, do not put garage doors on front elevation. And maybe I should have brought a photo of this, but um, we do have areas in West Covina that were built, basically they're all all, all in a whole block, they're all rear entry. So what that means you have to go around the back and pull in from behind. The garage door, you can't see it from the street. Um, it has been the thought that we, if that's the case for a neighborhood, if it's predominantly that way, that they should be preserved and they shouldn't be allowed to put the garage door on the front. Again, it's a guideline. It's something that has to be discussed at the subcommittee when they come up. What does predominantly mean? Because every situation is a little bit different. <clears throat> and then lastly, Provide uh, city-owned parkway width on the plans to ensure that the front setback is correct and to educate the property owner, uh, property owner on the location of the front property line. In almost every single lot in the city of West Covina between the curb and the front property line, there's this area that's owned by the city that's part of the street right-of-way, but a lot of people are, un are unaware that that's not their property. Uh, that's important for us to know, especially if they're doing an addition to the front yard, in the front yard, or the front of the house because there's a minimum setback that has to be met. And if they're measuring from the curb, they're probably measuring wrong. So we need to make sure that's on the plan. We, we try to get that on every plan even when it's not a setback issue. And then uh, lastly, landscaping should be complete before final inspection. We saw some pictures there of the photo sims where you had a really stark landscaping and then you had you know, people that put in really you know, some nice landscaping. And landscaping can make a lot of difference and we, we don't want to see us approve a house and have it set there with no landscaping for years. So the neighbors. Uh, aren't usually pre very appreciative of that. It's very difficult for the city to address that after the fact. So we want to let them know that up front. So that, that's the, the one-story guidelines. I, don't, I should have paused before and asked if you had questions as we went along, but I, I'm very interested if you want to discuss anything uh, to, that we do that. That's why this is sort of an education thing. We talked about that, that we would be bringing things. This is the first in a series, I think, of things that the, the, the Planning Commission um, uh, should be aware of because there may be things that come before the full planning commission that start at subcommittee. Any questions and comments? Oh, Dave? I'll, I'll just throw, throw in a couple of things on the one story so far. Uh, being on the design review for a while, right, uh, things that come up all the time are basically a one story neighborhood with a two story house. The biggest problem we had probably in the last five years is one, the neighbors are uh, not happy because the one behind held a pool and they figured they'd be looking down in their yard and the one next door was worried about the sun being cut off from their house. Plus the other neighbors didn't want the two-story. They eventually ended up with a one-story house, but most times not compatible with, with the uh, neighborhood. That's happened. Uh, the house is completely out of character with the neighborhood. Even though it might be a one-story, it's got different design completely. Uh, no alternative. Um, on a lot of the additions, they don't think either. They don't think about it, or they or they don't uh, want the uh, expense of it. But uh, it looks so much better to have it look like it's tied in with the house where it's always been there, you know. And another thing is, we, there's one right now where the garage is on a side yard, completely visible by the street. When they brought in their plans, the garage didn't match the house at all. It was had a completely different design. So with staff and the, uh, I think that came to the commission, I can't remember now, but anyway, the garage is going to be designed to, to match the house. So basically that's what I had in mind for one story. So go ahead, Jeff, with the two story. Okay.
And feel free as I go along here, I didn't say that before, if you want to interrupt me and ask questions or make a comment about in, in a particular slide, that, that, that's, we, we can take as much time as we need to provide you information. Thanks, Ron. Okay, so second story. Design the two-story house or addition so that all setbacks, including second story, have been met. And um, one of the things is in our code is that uh, there we have a different second story setback than first story setback on the side and I mean yeah the front and the side. So the this, the front setback is more for a second story than it is for a first story, and the same with the side. Um, and that's meant to provide a little bit more privacy and separation and air and light between lots so you don't end up with a five foot sort of corridor effect. That, that's why it was put in place. In an area that is predominantly one story, consider reducing the size of the second story in relation to the ground floor. A smaller floor will not appear as massive or boxy. And um, I guess I want to reiterate and, and, and kind of what, uh, some of the things that Dave said about the trying to fit a one story, a two story into a one story neighborhood. A lot of our guidelines in this regard are in that vein. Now we do have neighborhoods in the city that are two story neighborhoods. So this, this guideline wouldn't really, uh, wouldn't be uh, appropriate for that. This is more for when you're trying to put a two story in a one story. You need to provide that, you need to provide a softening effect. And we'll go into, I'll show you a little bit what I mean by that. Um, this is a, this is a two story house that has a second story setback that's greater than the first story setback. So it's pushed back, you can see a roof line that's, that helps separate and it helps what we call uh, horizontal, horizontal articulation. So the building feels like there's movement this way not vertical, and we'll see, uh, there are some pictures, we'll show some vertical. But that, that is very important in a, when you're trying to fit something, a, a second story addition into a one story neighborhood. And, and I guess uh, some of the things that, that uh, chair, the chairman was mentioning was that there may be times that the, the commission or the council for that matter determines that a, a two story in, in, a, in one neighborhood might fit for some reason, but there may be other times when they feel like you know, two stories really not appropriate here, and that's happened. We've had two stories denied both at the planning commission level and at the city council level. So it, that that does uh, occur, and it's it's kind of a it's one of those thorny questions that the planning commission and city council have to have to wrestle with, and the subcommittee gets to wrestle with it first, generally. So <clears throat> this is another house where you see that the the second story is pushed back. It's way it's way back behind the uh, 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 an arm of the, of the house that sticks out of the first story. This is one house that has a smaller, a very small second story in, in regards to the first. And you, there's two extremes with second stories. You can have a second story that's straight up and down, so it looks like a box, which can work if the whole development is built that way. I think we have some neighborhoods that are pretty much like that in West Virginia, especially on the south side. Um, but, if it, but again, if it's in a one story, then that becomes an issue. But this, these kind of, um, Here's another example of the same house. We, we call these kind of um, additions birdhouses because it kind of looks like a birdhouse sitting on top. Um, and they're, they're very difficult to work with because usually the applicant has determined that they don't have enough room on the ground floor, on the, on the, on the ground to add an addition. And they want, let's say, a 450 square foot master suite. So that's what they're going for. They don't want any more room than that. That's all the space they need. And so it becomes a really difficult question. We, we try to do what we can to fix those. Um, I shouldn't say fix, that's the wrong word, but to make them look a little better. But sometimes there's not much you can do. And, and I don't know over the history, I don't think over the history of the subcommittee we've ever denied one of these because we want to make sure that people can, it, for that reason. We've never denied one because it was too small in addition on the second floor. We might have denied, denied it might have been denied because it, didn't, it wasn't appropriate for the area. The second story wasn't appropriate for the area. There was privacy impacts or something like that. But I don't think it's ever been denied just because it was too small. But it is kind of, it, you can see that it doesn't necessarily look all that attractive. Here's another example of that same kind of thing. <clears throat> New second story additions can result in privacy impacts to neighboring properties. Design second story additions to reduce or eliminate the need for windows on the side elevations. High windows may also restrict views and preserve privacy. And I apologize, this is one thing, we didn't find any good uh, pictures. Well, I think, actually, I do have a picture later on I can show you what I mean by high windows. We sometimes refer to them as clerestory windows or windows that are, don't have any in this room except for if you're up there in the crow's nest and you look back this way, there's some windows up there. They're, they're high, they're above, you can't, you can't see out of them. But light comes in. 
You can't, I shouldn't say you can't see Adam. You can see Adam, but you're looking at the sky. You can't look down at the neighboring property. So it's kind of an, a nice, um, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a way to compromise, to provide them to have it, but not affect their ability to look into the neighboring uh, property's um, backyard. In an area that is predominantly one story, the elements of the house usually emphasize the horizontal. One story is generally a horizontal looking house. Many modern two-story designs emphasize the vertical through two-story porches with tall columns, tall windows, and two-story front elevations with no horizontal breaks. These, ele these elements are generally out of character with a one-story neighborhood. Um, and, and, and that's true. A lot of times if you go to newer developments where they're two stories, they will, they will emphasize that, that it's two stories. They'll make it look like it's tall. And you don't really want to make it look like it's tall when it's in a neighborhood of one story. You want to try to keep it more horizontal. This is a good um, example of a house that's got horizontal emphasis. You can see you know, the, the, the second story is set back and the porch is, is kind of projects out front and you've got this long roof line that, that makes it feel um, more horizontal than, than vertical. Here's an example of a house where they didn't, they were emphasizing the, the, the vertical. You've got a giant porch that goes up 15 or 20 feet in height, way above, I mean the doors, these doors are probably 8 feet, so maybe it's 16 feet. So it's, it's huge, you know, it doesn't provide weather protection. It's not, it's meant, it's not meant for those kind of things, what you would normally think of a front porch as doing. It's meant to emphasize the grandness or the scale of the house. And, and I'm not saying that that's necessarily a bad thing. In certain settings, that might be okay. But in a neighborhood where you have one story, that's probably not going to fit very well. And we have neighborhoods where this kind of house is developed. The whole neighborhood is like this. And it, and it works fine. But it, uh, it, it, this, this is a good example of a house emphasizing vertical. And this is another one. The other thing that you can see um, besides the tall porch is you, you don't have that break where you have a roof line that's ex exposed. And, and that, and a second story that's set back from the first story. These, these are emphasizing the height because it's from the ground up, it's all one plane. So again, that's, that can be fine. What I would say about this house in, is that it's got good roof articulation. There's movement. There's movement in the walls. See, this wall's moving back and forth. So they, it's, not a plain face, it's not a faceless plane. So they've done some things to help with it, what we call the articulation or movement, but it wouldn't really fit into a one-story area. So I, I guess I, I don't want you to get the idea that we're against two stories or vertical two stories. It's just they need to be in the right setting. Okay. When adding a second story elevation in a one story area, consider providing a significant second story setback on the front elevation. By setting back the second story from the first story, the, the front of the house will fit better in the context of a one story neighborhood. And we've, this is kind of the same kind of philosophy we've been talking about a little bit here with um, with, with two stories. So here we have a house. It, this house looks to me like it may, it probably did have a second story addition, but they put it back fairly far back, 20 or 30 feet probably behind the original front elevation of the house. So to push it back away, so you, and you can see that the neighboring house is a one story. So it has a, it has, has a different feel. Now, I would tell you that there's a conundrum there because in a one story neighborhood, you know, these people are used to privacy, and you're saying, when we're saying push this back, well, what does that do to the windows? Pushes them further back into the backyard. So there's a little bit of a conundrum, but design, in a design sense, this, this works much better than pushing the house all the way out to the, pushing the second story all the way out to the front. And here's another example where it's not quite as, as, as much as uh, a push back as far, but you still see that it's pushed back. There's, there's a setback that's different here, it's different here, and the porch is, is set back. And there, you can also see a roof line there. I think this is an example of a house that doesn't have any setback on the second story. It's just straight up and down. So it's very emphasized that that two-story uh, facade is very much inter emphasized. I believe this house was probably built that way, and it, I don't think it's. In, I think it's in a two-story area. So it, it probably works okay that way, but that's not what you'd want to see if you were adding a, a, a two-story element in a predominantly one-story um, neighborhood. <clears throat> in an area that is predominantly one story, the addition of a second story balcony, especially in a flatland neighborhood, can have an effect on privacy. In, in these areas, balconies and rear yards are discouraged. So we really very much discourage people putting a, even 
putting a second floor with a balcony or even without a so they can just look into their neighbor's yards. Because in many neighborhoods, you could probably see into six or eight backyards just by, by putting a balcony in your, in your backyard. And when designing a second story addition, consider that all sides of the second story are visible and window treatment and, and you know, details should be considered on all four elevations, not just the front elevation. It's easy to do that on a one story because the other elevations are hidden. But on a two story, you can see it from all sides. And here's an example. It's, this one, it's a little hard to see this, but you can see that if you, as you're walking down the street, you can clearly see the side elevations of these units and you would be able to see all of them. And, they, and you can also see sort of hidden back here behind this portico share that they have window treatment on, on the side elevations uh, of, of those houses. Here's one, two, where uh, this, this is the example of the clerestory window. You see this window is a smaller, this is a larger, more like a picture window, but this is smaller and higher. So you, you, it's harder to see out and down. And also they put the window treatment around that's the same as on the front elevation. So th that's a good example of, of both of those two things. The other things that we suggest for um, second story additions, discuss the proposed house or addition with your neighbors. Uh, generally, at this point in time, any second story is going to be an administrative use permit. It's going to require notification of the neighborhood, the neighbors. And we always suggest, you know, if we're going to notify the neighbors, it'd be better if you heard it. If they heard it from you, than from us at the time of the hearing. So we always uh, let people know that. Again, landscaping should be completed before the final inspection, same as on one story, provide city-owned parkway width, which is the same as well, and then also with the rear entry garages. Those suggestions are also on the second story. So that concludes our presentation on that. Any comments or questions? Well, it just seems to me that philosophically, the difficulty is in a neighborhood that's all, that has been all one story, is to be the pioneer, mm -hmm. to come in and say, I'd like to do something with two stories. I remember so well Arcadia 30 or 40 years ago with the little one-story homes along the major avenues. And then now, of course, they're all two-story yeah. giants. But when the first one came in, it looked really strange. And that would be difficult to become acceptable to the neighbors, become acceptable to the city, and yet what happened was we realized then everything went that direction, and so they're all big two-story homes now. Yeah. So it's the it's finding the pioneer and finding the pioneering spirit, I guess, of somebody yes. that's willing to do something with great compromise. Yes, and it's up and it's up to the city, starting with the subcommittee, to determine, make a determination when it when it's appropriate to allow that sec that first pioneer second story to be constructed. And as I said, there have been a lot of situations where the city determined, and I say the city because. Sometimes it was, it's never the subcommittee that determines that. It's always the Planning Commission or the City Council. But both of those bodies have at times denied people's requests to do that. But, and I don't think anybody necessarily enjoyed doing that because they, I think they understood the, the cost and the desire to stay in the neighborhood. But, um, you know, once it, it does, it will change the character of the neighborhood. So the thought was the neighborhood should, should remain as it is. One thing to say about two-story, we've had, we've had a few since I've been on the commission here that like the Shaw Bilts in West Covina are 1,200 square feet basically. They got a small lot and on top of the 1,200 square feet they want to put like maybe 2,500. They want to go back end up because they got a pool and they have a three-car garage in the back. Sometimes you just can't have everything on, on a lot, you know, and that's the only reason they're going two-story. They'd probably be happier to go back if they had enough room, but no, they had to go up. So. We've, we've turned some down and we've let some go through. So right. anyway, it's kind of a, you know, uh, hit or miss situation in a, you know, case by case as we get them. Yeah. So that's the way it goes. Okay. And that, that's my, my presentation. So we can move on if there's no other questions. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Any questions at, at all? No. Okay. All right. That was, that was very good. All right. Any? Part, yes, I, Commissioner. I, I, have a, I have a question or an interest in talking about attachment three. Oh, sure. That will it be appropriate to do that now? Would it? Okay. Sure. All right. I understand that that the subdivision acts on behalf of the commission uh, or the the subcommittee. Acts subcommittee, on yes. Of the commission uh, by order of city code. Uh, 
I, I just, many, many years ago, I was a planning commissioner in another small city. Mm -hmm. And back in those times, everything came to the planning commission. And so uh, I'm still trying to wrestle myself with what, what is it that's happening? Why does it need to happen in the form it's happening? What is it that's happening that the planning commission needs to be more aware of? Those kinds of thoughts mm -hmm. go through one's mind. And uh, I understand, I think, the issue uh, that we've talked about relative to timing when someone wants to get a project accomplished. But I think the subcommittee meets just before the planning commission meets. That's correct, that yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. Mm. If I understand what you're, you're, you're kind of wondering why it just didn't, why they don't just come to the planning commission. Yeah. Um, And some cities probably have made that choice. Uh, I think the thought was at, at, at the time that we wanted this to be a, uh, a, a, a not, I'm not sure how to say it in the, in the, in the positive way, so I'll say it in the negative way. The, it, it, we, we wanted it to be a, 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 a not a long or detailed review. So it's more of a cursory review, whereas things that come to Planning Commission are more a detailed review. And, um, while the, while the agendas, you're, you're correct in the way that the agendas work and that they happen simultaneously, basically, um, we are usually able to move things through the subcommittee process much quicker than we move things through the planning commission process. Mm -hmm. So, I th and then I guess a third thing there, which may not seem obvious in today's economy, is when, when we, we started this, there wasn't a lot of time at the planning commission. They, they were very busy. There was a lot of items at Planning Commission, so we were trying to uh, not impact, overly impact the Planning Commission. I think those, those would be my, my response, and you know, I guess I'm the only person that can answer that very easily, because none of the other commissioners here were on the commission in 2003, um, and it, it sort of has developed, it evolved, I think is a good word, because I don't think when we originally started in 2003, it was, we've evolved, it's diff it, we're doing different things than we, we originally started. I understand these are open meetings. They are open so meetings. So frankly, if I want, if any of us, if the public room, wanted to attend. want to come in and observe that process, we could do so. Could the public is 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 right. is av available to come, correct? Right. And and sometimes we do have public there. Okay. Except that we have two commissioners there. If we have a third one show up, that might be a different thing. We'd have to talk to the city attorney about how that how we would handle that. Okay. But that that's that's different than the public being able to be there. All right. Okay, thank you. And, and uh, one other thing on, on that note, although we don't have it on tonight's agenda, you might remember that the last agenda, well, one, we, one thing we've done to try to keep the, there's a couple things we've done to try to keep the Planning Commission involved. We, we will, so, sometimes things get forwarded to, to the Planning Commission, but the other thing that w to keep the Planning Commission involved is we, at, at once a month, we provide minutes of the subcommittee meeting so that you know what was on and what the decisions were. So you see the kind of, you have the ability to review. So everything that they do is gonna be on your agenda at some point in the form of their minutes. Uh, the reason they're not on tonight is because I don't think there was a subcommittee meeting between the last time you met and now. So we didn't put them on this one, but the next meeting there will be. So we've tried to oh, keep okay. you informed in, in, that, in that regard. Because we, we, we know that other planning commissioners need to know because in the past year we've had at least one item that got forwarded from the subcommittee of the Planning Commission, maybe two. So it, that does happen. That's not uncommon for things to start at the subcommittee and end up being a Planning Commission decision. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> okay, we'll move on. Uh, continuation of oral communications. Anyone wishing to speak at this time? I have a question, Joe. All right. Come right on up, sir. State your name. and. Uh, Senator Roo, uh, resident of West Covina, homeowner. All right. Uh, my question is regarding... It seems rather subjective, uh, the exceptions to the development, and with regards to squashing of that pioneer spirit, if it's subjective like that, how, how is a developer going to be able to actually measure his expenses, um, expecting that the decision may be based on not so much a, a set of rules based on the safety or the development, the safety of the development, but rather the aesthetics of the uh, development? And it kind of smacks of, of 
too much oversight from our local government when, you know, someone that owns a residence is subjected to subjective decision making. And, and, and honestly, that's not really a question. It's more of a comment. So by no means, Jeff, don't feel <laughs> <laughs> well. Yeah, I'll answer it a little bit, but I don't know that I can answer it to the best to, uh, well, my comment on that would be that anything that comes before the Planning Commission or the City Council is discretionary. So everything that comes, there's a certain amount of discretion. They, there's not a guarantee. We never guarantee someone something's going to be approved. So any time there's discretionary, there's, there's always some type, type of risk. Well, our, our goal for the, for the guidelines has been to help them to, get as, uh, to reduce that risk so they can do certain things that help. And most, in my, in my experience, that, that we haven't had hardly any issues with one stories. It's just the two stories that come up. And even though sometimes they follow the guidelines, there's still been a decision by the Planning Commission or City Council to not approve. But that's within their scope, not as part of the subcommittee, but as part of the code which requires administrative use permits or conditional use permits. So I think that's the, the best answer I can give is this, everything that comes here is discretionary and can be denied. It's, it's up to the Planning Commission to make it what they think is the appropriate decision. Right. And actually, when they, when they make contact with the city the first time out, they usually give them the, the guidelines we have. And a lot of times they'll follow those, but sometimes they won't, and that's where the problem starts. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But usually the subcommittee can handle that by telling them follow the guidelines, and the next right. time they bring it back, they follow and the guidelines. So. Most, time, most times that happens. It works yeah. Out pretty well. Okay, thank you. Uh, we move on to commissioner reports and comments. Any uh, comments from anybody? Any reports? Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Manny? Just, just like to comment uh, that I appreciate very much what Jeff has put together for us in terms of that educational process we as new members need so badly. And uh, in his usual manner, the thoroughness with which he approaches the subject is very much appreciated. So thank you, Jeff. You're welcome. Any other comments? Ready? Any comments? I'm just saying. Okay. Commissioner Woods, any comments? Okay. Uh, just one comment for me. We, and uh, as time allows, in our uh, next uh, sessions, we'll have, we have uh, more study sessions. We have about four or five more items that are coming up. And the uh, time we get th finished with those, we should be pretty much all up to date on the things that are happening. And, and just, just so if I could interrupt there, the, the next one we're going to talk about is conditional use permits. What's the purpose of condition use permits? What's the process? So that'll be uh, the, the July 10th meeting. We're planning on bringing that back. Right, right. Anyway, uh, we'll go from that and go to the uh, planning director's report. Um, planning director's report, we have the monthly status uh, report on there um, as item six and um, city council action. There hasn't been a city council meeting since the last time uh, the planning commission met, so there's nothing to report. Correct. All right. And the city council action? No, oh, there's nothing to report because we haven't had a meeting. I mean, they had, didn't have a meeting this last week. All right. I just found what I was looking for here uh, on, on our study sessions. The uh, conditional use permit is next, and if we don't change it at all, it's going to be variances following that, development standard terminology and code amendments, wireless facilities, single family reviews, and the CEQA. So we've got a pretty good outline of things to fill in as we can do it. And we may add to that list as we go. We'll, yeah. we'll, that, that, that probably gets us through most of the rest of the year, which is does it. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other comments? If not, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So move. So move. Commissioner Menifee? Second. 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 Commissioner Valles? All in favor? All right. All right. All right. We're adjourned. <laughs>